CataractCoach.com. IOL calculations after LASIK. How do you use all of this data? And do you need to? So on this page here, we see a lot of biometric data measuring the eye, lots of parameters. There's a lot of overlap. What's actually important? Remember that in doing a lens calculation, the three most important issues are what's the power of the cornea, what's the axial length of the eye, and what's the effective lens position. So the prior LASIK is not going to change the axial length, so that we're okay with. But it most definitely changes how our machines measure and read the cornea. And it can also change how some of the formulas calculate the effective lens position. So let's talk about that. In this printout, we have a sheet from the NIDEC OPD scan. And what are the boxes here? Let's start with the, the top left box. That is essentially the refraction starting with the center of the pupil and going out. And you can see from looking at this that it's relatively uniform, about the same refraction. And that's measured in that central pupil zone. Now the second box, the top middle box, is a topography of the cornea, an axial uh, measurement. You notice that it does have a map as well as in the bottom corner of that box, the SIMK values. And on the top of that box, it says APP, and that's that average power there in that central cornea. The top right box is the lens. That's the internal power of the eye. And so you can look at that top row now. The total power of the eye is the cornea plus the lens. It does make a lot of sense here. The bottom left corner is the pupil. And we can see that both the photopic and mesopic pupil sizes. And we'll also show you even the relative position of the central visual axis to the pupil. The middle box on the bottom row shows you the autorefractor. And you can see on the bottom of that, it says both at a 4 millimeter and also the maximum 5 millimeter zone in this eye. If the eye dilated more, it'd give a wider reading. And then it also shows at the central six millimeters of the cornea, what are the HOAs? That's higher order aberration. Remember the Zernike polynomials? The easy one to remember is that lower order aberrations are sphere and cylinder, what you can fix in a refraction. Higher order aberrations, such as spherical aberration, are the fourth uh, um, term, fourth polynomial. And the bottom right corner is the topography, and that's placido disc topography. It's a reflection off the surface of the cornea, and that data is used to calculate that topographic map there. So a lot of important information here. Next, we have a printout from a dual Scheinflug tomographer. It does have a topography component too, but importantly, a tomographer. So it's taking many slices through the cornea and piecing together a 3D map. Let's start off at looking at the pictures here on the left, the four pictures. The top left one, that's the anterior axial curvature, so similar to the previous test that we did. The bottom left corner is the total corneal power via ray tracing. Notice how it's a little different. With ray tracing, the central corneal power is a little bit less. The white ring that's projected there, the small ring there, shows the centration of the pupil. The top right picture is the corneal pachymetry. This is important. We can notice from this that certainly there's been thinning out of the central cornea. And that means the patient had a myopic LASIK done, where the central corneal power was decreased on the anterior surface, of course, on the cornea. So his pachymetry is about 500 microns in the center, and you can see as we go out, it gets progressively more and more. A good kind of metric to keep in your mind is that the average laser tends to be about 15 to maybe 20 microns of tissue removed per diopter of myopia. So just by guessing at this picture here, if the normal unablated part is that 580, 590 range, 570 range even, that maybe the center had about three diopters of tissue removed. So about, let's say, 50 microns. 
So somewhere in that range. That's a good guess. Look at the data now, the right side of this page, all that column of data. Starting at the top, we have the sim case, simulated K values here. And we can show you where the steep and the flat is and the amount of astigmatism. The next one is the anterior instantaneous curvature, tangential. Then underneath it is a very useful bit of data. The total corneal power 2, so TCP2, which is ray traced. And the important value here is that mean value is 39.63. And there is about a diopter, a unit of, of astigmatism there, very consistent. Other important uh, metrics are here. The anterior chamber biometry, the corneal shape asymmetry, if you're worried about keratoconus, but we're obviously not looking at that here. And let's go to the next page. Now we're looking here at an OCT image of the cornea. The top half of the page is the pachymetry, so it tells me how thick the cornea is at any given point. We've got a good, reliable reading here. And we can see that central cornea is, in this case, and this measurement looks a little thinner, 481, whereas the previous machine measured about 500 microns, so somewhere in that range. It also gives us that posterior power, which is about minus 6 in most size. Remember, LASIK is different than RK. RK changes the shape of the entire cornea, front and back. LASIK and PRK just change the anterior shape of the cornea. They don't change the posterior shape or posterior power. The bottom is the epithelial map of the uh, cornea. Now, this is the page from our biometer, where we measure, importantly, the axial length of the eye. It also does show us a central corneal thickness. So now they're all pretty consistent. This is 486 microns, so consistent with the previous two devices. This also gives us an anterior chamber depth, a lens thickness, and also importantly, corneal powers. Now these corneal powers are reading a little higher than some of the other machines because this doesn't take into account any prior LASIK and it's measured in a different method. On this biometer, there are two rings, each having 16 points, so a total of 32 points, and measured at about the two-ish millimeter range from the center. Pupil data here as well, white to white, etc. Now, the right side of the page, why do we have this big red warning sign through this? Well, we don't want to use these because the printout that the machine's giving, this is the standard printout that shows lens calculations for a virgin eye. And we don't have that. We have an eye that had prior LASIK. Probably the most commonly used and most useful calculator for this is at the ASCRS website. So it's iol.ascrs.org. It's free. It's accessible to everyone. In this device, this online calculator, we enter all the data that we have here. So let's go through it top, top to bottom. So, of course, doctor name, patient name, right eye, lens power, important top right corner, what's the target refraction? In this case, we do have pre-LASIK data. We knew the patient was minus 3 before surgery. And then afterwards, the patient did end up with a, a zero or planar refraction. We don't have the pre-op K values. Now, in all these boxes, we fill in whatever data we have. So I've showed you already we had the NIDEC APP, so we put that 41.37 right there in the middle of the page. To the right of that is the Galilei TCP2, 39.63. In this case, we don't have ATLAS measurements. So we don't have that. We don't have a pentacam. We do have the OCT, the RT view, and so we can enter the net corneal power here, 41.08, the posterior power, minus 6.16, and the central corneal thickness. Finally, on the bottom is the ultrasound or biometric data, and so that's from our machine. Our K value is taken right from that uh, measurement. Axial length, anterior chamber depth, lens thickness, white to white. Lens constants, these tend to be personalized per surgeon, and the values shown here are the ones I've personalized for that specific lens. These are specific to me. And finally, here's the printout page. And on that ASCRS calculator, it prints it out into two main columns, one showing with, with old data, and the second column is without old data. And they're remarkably similar. 
it calculates only for the data that you've entered. So if I look at the left column with old data, I get most of these around the 22 diopter mark for the anticipated IOL, which will give a Plano outcome. And on the right side of the page, without old data, we get similar, maybe a little bit higher on the lens power for most. So the bottom here, it says average of IOL power for all available formulas, 22.07. The minimum value is 2151, and the max is 2264. So what do you do now? So you have a range. Some surgeons just like to put in the average power because that tends to be pretty close. Other surgeons prefer one method over the others, such as the modified masket over the Barrett, or they like the Haggis over the Galilei. You will learn this with experience. In my case here, I know I'd rather have the patient end up with a little bit of myopia. And so on these, I choose a 22.5 diopter lens, and I think that's going to give us the best overall vision. And importantly, we'll use the healing of the first eye to help hone the lens calculations of the second eye. So in the second eye, we can be a little bit more accurate. So from all the data here, I would choose 22.5, and that'd give the patient, in all likelihood, just a pinch of post-op myopia. Thank you for watching.